want to turn now to uh, Dr. Mike. Now, Mike Murray, he's the uh, Jane Dunaway Director of Veterinary Services at Monterey Bay Aquarium, and somebody that I've come to know through this process and have really appreciated uh, that opportunity. He and I share a number of interests. So uh, there's no, uh, Mike's was the very first chapter I went to when the draft started coming in. Uh, don't ask me to give uh, answer a quiz, Mike, but uh, <laughs> really informative, and I hope everybody takes the time to read this chapter. It's it's very important. So, Mike, uh, with that, I appreciate your participation. Take it away. Well, thank you very much. We'll see if I can pull off the sharing of the screen. Oh, did that work? Yep, you're good. Oh, well, I don't know about that. Don't see if you say I'm good when I'm done. Um, thank you all very much for this opportunity to um, share this with you. It's uh, quite an honor to be part of this team. Uh, thank you, Tim, for inviting me to join you in this um, feasibility study. What I want to do today is try and talk a little bit about the um, animal health and welfare aspects that that I looked at and was charged to uh, try and evaluate. I will apologize a little bit. This is, tends to be a bit text heavy. Uh, if you've listened to veterinarians talk much before, you, you know that we end up spending a lot more time with blood and guts than, than is really necessary. So I, I've tried to, to keep that to a bare minimum. The goal that I had in, in writing chapter 10, uh, Animal Health and Welfare, was to provide information on the potential health and welfare hazards which may negatively impact the success of reintroduction of sea otters to the Oregon coast. Um, it was a very large project. There was an awful lot of stuff to look at. I based a lot of my interpretation on three major publications, one by Dr. Melissa Miller from California Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, looking at causes of death of sea otters um, published in 2020. A similar paper looking at the Washington sea otters um, was put out by Leanne White in 2018. And Dr. Uh, Kathy Burek Huntington published a, a, another paper uh, looking at Alaskan otters in early 2021. Um, so those were really the, the backbone, although there are a number of other references that you'll see I, I drew upon. Over the next 30 minutes, what I'd really like to do is talk a bit about animal health, specifically. Uh, an infectious disease and a couple of non-infectious diseases that I feel are the most concerning in a translocated population. We will talk very briefly about animal welfare and then a, a few other uh, health and welfare considerations that come to the mind of a veterinarian who's worked with sea otters uh, a little bit in the past. Before I go any further though, I, I do feel obliged to, to give you a couple of definitions only because the definitions tend to get a little bit stepped on uh, by current use, uh, especially during this time of a pandemic talking about infectious disease and, and that. In the chapter, I have a pretty tight definition of infectious disease and an infectious disease is a disease caused by a living organism, um, essentially caused by a virus, a bacterium, a fungus, a protozoa, or a metazoan parasite. Um, it has nothing to do how that disease gets from animal A to animal B. It's just the fact that it's caused by a living organism. If a disease is transmissible between animals, um, the terminology I use is either transmissible, communicable, or contagious. Um, so I've really tried to, to restrict my definitions. If we have a disease that's transmitted from animals, to humans under normal circumstances, that's considered zoonotic. A normal circumstance would be, you know, essentially day-to-day -day living. An abnormal circumstance would be uh, in a laboratory setting or in a necropsy floor. And then there are non-infectious diseases. And there are two non-infectious diseases that I selected to talk with you all about today. One of them is domoic acid intoxication. And the other one is uh, shark bite injuries. 
in the chapter, you will see this table, um, and it's a pretty extensive table that, that I put together looking at the, the health concerns, um, what is the, the baseline cause, be it traumatic or infectious disease, um, whether or not it's of major concern and how likely it is, are there any specific, specific concerns like being associated with areas uh, with high pinniped activity, uh, high human activity, freshwater runoff. Um, but you can see there, you know, the better part of 20 diseases listed here. And in 30 minutes, I'm not going to be able to do justice to those. So I really have picked three diseases that I wanted to present quickly. Morbillivirus, virus, demoic acid, demoic acid intoxication, and shark bite injury. So we'll start with morbillivirus. Uh, morbillivirus is, um, has a large number of diseases that can be devastating to a broad spectrum of animals. Uh, the most note, noteworthy one for humans is going to be measles, it is caused by a morbillivirus. In the eyes of the sea otter though, really there are two morbilliviruses of concern. One is the canine distemper virus that we're probably most all familiar with because we uh, are aware of its impact on our domestic dogs, and we have animals immunized for that uh, every year or every two years, depending upon uh, the animal's age. Possible exposure routes in um, with canine distemper virus are going to be from dogs, um, domestic dogs that may be on the beach, from raccoons, uh, from river otters. Uh, River otters in particular share that same ecotype as do the sea otters and, and they're kind of neighbors quite frequently. So that exposure rate is, is potentially pretty high. If you've ever had the opportunity to see a sea otter investigating something on land, they, they really get into it. They get that nose right down on the rock and they're really snorting away and sniffing and you can actually hear them um, checking out the odors. So if we had a river otter that, that had distemper virus and sneezed some, some mucoid discharge onto a rock. The sea otter came up there to haul out. They would find patient would certainly be exposed to a uh, morbillivirus. Uh, foreseen morbillivirus um, was the result of a mass mortality event in seals in the North Atlantic. Thus far, we really haven't seen these epizootics, which is the animal version of an epidemic in pinnipeds in the uh, Pacific Ocean. Uh, in sea otters, we had 40% seropositivity in sea otters back in the Kodiak and the Eastern Aleutians published in 2009. Very low incidence of positive serum antibody titers in Southern sea otters. Um, but it tends to be a respiratory disease. You can see in this gray seal, uh, the discharge coming out of the nose, um, excessive salivation, the area around the eyes is swollen. If you look closely at that, it would all be inflamed. He probably has a pneumonia. It will affect the central nervous system as well. One of the concerns is the loss of um, old sea ice um, up in the Arctic and the potential for moving animals, particularly the marine mammals from the east coast through the Bering Strait to the West Coast and what kind of exposure that may have on naive animals. So it's possible to get pinnipeds moving across and starting to get into the Pacific and exposing these three naive harbor seals that have probably never seen phocene morbillivirus. If they get infected because harbor seals and sea otters often share fallout areas, the potential for exposure to sea otters certainly does exist. So my, my, my interpretation of the information I was able to see was that uh, the current risk of population levels of morbillivirus virus is probably pretty low, but the potential of exposure by infected carnivores uh, or forced seals does exist. And I don't think we can ignore that as a possible threat and a possible risk to a translocated population. The second disease I want to talk about was demoic acid intoxication. Um, demoic acid is a water-soluble glutamate analog. Glutamate is one of the neurotransmitters that has very high levels in the brain, particularly the hippocampus, which are these little C-shaped structures back kind of behind your ears in the brain involved in memory. Um, 
It also has uh, high levels in the as a transmitter in cardiac muscle. So you do see high levels of glutamate in cardiac tissue as well. Demoic acid is produced at times by a diatom called Pseudonychia, specifically Pseudonychia australis. Um, there are a number of environmental factors and probably some genetic factors that predispose this diatom to producing uh, demoic acid. In humans, it causes amnesic shellfish poisoning, which was first identified in Eastern Canada back in, I believe, 1988. Typically, it is a marine biotoxin that's most commonly encountered in the spring and summer, um, but that, that tends to be shifting a little bit as uh, climate change is occurring. It is very much associated with oceanographic conditions uh, and eutrophication of nearshore waters. And it's important to recognize that not all blooms make toxin. So you actually can see these frustules. This is Pseudonychia australis frustules, the diatom itself. Um, and you can see those in times without demoic acid being associated with it. So their, their mere presence does not necessarily um, mean that there is in fact a, a threat present. One of the concerns we have for uh, demoic acid intoxication in Oregon is the fact that recreational clamming is, is, is a really, um, it's something a lot of folks do. And there are a fair number of folks that participate in uh, some form of a subsistent hunt of these mollusks frequently, uh, particularly when other types of marine biotoxins are not present. So there is a potential conflict there. But the good news is it does mean that there is some degree of monitoring for demoic acid um, in nearshore and in pelagic waters that is done by the Oregon Department of Health. The problem when we try and apply that to sea otters is that these large scale monitoring systems may not apply. Um, and some work done by Dr. Shanks, who's going to be speaking, I believe tomorrow about Dungeness crabs, demonstrated really well that you're going to have variability in um, the presence of demoic acid based on some surf zone hydrodynamics and morphology. So th this green dye is a fluorescein stain. It's a, it's a non-toxic stain that's been put in the water column. And you can see the plume of dye that's heading out towards pelagic water, and that's a rip current. And these dissipative surf zone rip currents are actually very efficient at exchanging water from the surf zone out into the pelagic part of the water. So if you have a pseudonychio bloom further out to sea where some of the monitoring occurs, a rip current or a, a dissipative surf zone is actually gonna help move that back into the, the coastal area a bit more efficiently. Um, oppose that to the surf zone on either side of that plume, that reflective surf zone really does have very limited exchange with the pelagic waters. So that tends not to bring the, the potential pseudonychia closer to the shallow waters where sea otter food may be found. Another consideration is that much of the monitoring is based on looking at muscles. And there is going to be a tremendous difference in how various um, bioaccumulators depurate or clear demoic acid from their bodies. In the, the muscle, the muscle tends to bioaccumulate demoic acid in its gastric gland. Uh, so it tends to depurate or clears that out relatively quickly. Compare that to the razor clam on the right, which is a very popular clamming you know, harvest species. They tend to bioaccumulate demoic acid in the foot and in the mantle. And as a result, it takes much, much longer time period for these animals to clear that biotoxin out of their muscle. So there may be an exposure event uh, several weeks prior, yet they still may have low levels of demoic acid present in their tissues that would be consumed by a sea otter. In the human, that's probably not gonna be as big of a problem, these low levels um, as it may be in a sea otter, 
primarily because we're not eating 25% of our body weight a day in muscles and razor clamps. Uh, so th these are, are much less consumed. So we may be able to, to get away with it. In the sea otter, they're going to be exposed through this prey uh, and they're going to potentially take in a great deal of domoic acid over time. Uh, some studies that were done by VTech in 2008 showed that we actually will have exposure through the four basic types of prey items that are, are going to be feeding um, on the diatoms. The filter feeders uh, like sand crabs or fat innkeeper worms. Predators um, they investigated was the Pacific sand dab. So even the Northern sea otter that may be a, a fish eater could be exposed. Uh, we may have scavengers like um, basket snails or hermit crabs, and then the deposit feeders like ghost shrimp, sand dollars, and olive snails. Uh, it's a difficult disease to diagnose in the sea otter antemortem. Some really nice work done by uh, Dr. Melissa Miller at California Department of Fish and Wildlife demonstrated how we have these changes, acute disease where these animals get a large amount in a very, very short time period, tend to cause neurologic signs, the chronic disease where they have these low level exposures over an extended time period tend not to cause neurologic disease. And it builds up over time affecting the glutamate receptors in the heart muscle and they will die of cardiomyopathy or, or heart failure. And then in the subacute, which is kind of halfway between one would tend to see both neurologic and cardiac changes at necropsy. So these are some uh, images from Miller, Melissa Miller's paper from earlier this year. Uh, number Letter A is a very normal brain. Letter C is a brain from an acutely intoxicated sea otter. And you can see the congestion in the blood vessels on the surface of the brain. Uh, you also can see that there's a bit of a change in color. There's a bit of swelling of the brain. Uh, covering up part of the cerebellum that's down towards the bottom of the, of the image. So it's definitely had an impact on the, the, the brain itself. This animal was probably seizuring before death. A chronic case, um, the normal heart is on the is letter A. You can see the abundant kind of white fat in the coronary groove be between the heart atriums and the ventricles. Um, Letter C is a chronic cardiomyopathy. You can see the heart muscle itself, rather than being that nice uniform kind of red-brown color, you can see patches and, and blotchiness of white. You can see some streaking in the heart muscle itself as well. Um, you can see the fat in the coronary groove between the two major sets of chambers has, has been dissipated and, and kind of a rounding of that heart as, as the heart muscle is starting to fail. I, I really think that the potential for domoic acid related morbid, morbidity and mortality is, is very likely in an Oregon post reintroduction effort. Um, we've got all of the, the predisposing things we'd be looking at. Um, we know that domoic acid does occur already. We've got the food source and the bioaccumulators. Um, so I do think that this is something that, that there's a, an excellent chance that domoic acid intoxication will be seen at some point. Shark bite trauma, and the good news is you have Dr. Sal Jorgensen talking tomorrow, and he can get into much more of this than, than I will. Um, suffice to say, it's the most common cause of death in southern sea otters in a publication um, by Miller in 98 to 2012. Um, it's had a greater impact on population recovery than any other specific cause of death. Um, Kim Tinker described that really well. It's interesting, these are non-consumptive bites. You know, the, the animal is biting the sea otter um, and these animals are dying either because of blood loss, um, striking a very large blood vessel, significant tissue trauma will occur, uh, but really importantly, there is this loss of thermal integrity. Most of these bites affect to some degree the dorsal part of the back and so these animals are laying on their back, that is in the water, and these injuries end up um, acting as thermal windows and they dump tremendous amounts of heat through these injuries to, um, to their back. Based on the data that we saw from Vera Cunnington and from Leanne White, it doesn't seem to be a big, it's very uncommon in Northern sea otters. 
And it doesn't seem that we really understand how many white sharks are currently off the coast in Oregon. That data doesn't exist yet. You can see this kind of uh, arcade of individual tooth marks um, in this particular sea otter carcass. Um, and that most of those are gonna be underwater. So they lose heat through that. In this poor individual's case, it also it appears that um, the injury transected his abdominal musculature and um, partially eviscerated the poor animal. At necropsy, we've, we've come to the, the conclusion that most of these are the result of, of white shark bites by the presence of white sharks, but also occasionally finding a little tooth fragment like you see here with the classic serrated edge of a white shark. Um, And you know these are the ones that are probably doing these exploratory bites. We don't have enough data to say if these are the big adults or perhaps one of these um, subadults that's making the conversion from a piscivorous diet to a marine mammal diet. There is another species that warrants discussion uh, off the Oregon coast, and that's the broad-nosed seven-gilled shark. Uh, you don't see them nearly as commonly. Uh, but the broad-nosed seven-gill shark is a dominant shark predator in coastal ecosystems worldwide. In adults, and they can get very large. Um, we had one in, at the Monterey Bay Aquarium that was about four meters in length. They will eat other elasmobranchs, and they also are a cons considerable predator for marine mammals. In Oregon, they feed at a very high trophic level. Um, and they are very abundant in uh, estuary and coastal ecosystems. They have a couple of hunting strategies that are rather unique. They will do the stalking like this uh, upper image and coming up behind and, and below a marine mammal. But they also have this social facilitated where a group will surround a marine mammal at depth um, and then kind of close in and then it turns into a bit of a feeding frenzy. So these would be otters that potentially would be uh, attacked uh, while foraging based on the work by Ebert. This part, unfortunately, is, is unknown. We don't know how many sharks are out there. Um, and it's unlikely that we would understand what impact this would have uh, until we actually embark on a reintroduction. I did want to really briefly talk about animal welfare, in part because I suspect the public's going to expect some acknowledgement of the importance of animal welfare in a reintroduction program. Um, it's challenging in free-ranging wildlife because much of our considerations in free-ranging wildlife looks at populations, yet much of the animal welfare discussion talks about individual animals. But I think there are applications both pre- and post-release Animal welfare is becoming increasingly scientific in, and its use of hypothesis-based investigations, but it still remains very subjective. Animal welfare is not static, it changes frequently. My welfare was pretty good this morning, but when I have to talk in front of a group like this, my welfare really does tank quite a bit. The animal welfare considerations that I used were based on the five freedoms that were uh, published in the United Kingdom back in 1965 uh, for use in uh, domestic agriculture. They've been shifted a little bit to be used in zoo and wildlife. Um, and so now they look at nutritionally complete diets, the existence of comfortable living experience, physical health, the presence of appropriate social groupings and the avoidance of common stress. So what I've done in the chapter is basically kind of outline what, what, how we might interpret that in a translocation. Uh, nutritionally complete diets would involve things like prey availability, access, quantity, familiarity. Are there risk factors um, of the predominant prey, like we talked about with domoic acid, like um, turbine snails and its associate, their association with toxoplasmosis? Um, and then the important part of, that Jim Bodkin talked about, about management during pre-release holding and conditioning, uh, probably not going to be feeding waterfowl and seals to the sea otters. Comfortable living experiences like appropriate habitat, um, avoiding undue anthropogenic disturbance. There are non-human risk factors like the presence uh, of sharks. Um, and then again, the pre-release holding conditions, 
what are we going to do for pre-release um, health assessment uh, response to animals in distress is something we're going to have to be aware of and be able to manage. Again, a public expectation that there will be a rehabilitation program um, in line for this. And then the post-release monitoring, again, that Jim Bodkin talked about, and then the carcass recovery and thorough necropsies to try and understand what is happening to these animals. What is the critical mass for release, particularly in an area where there aren't, that is not already occupied? How are we gonna hold these animals pre-release? How long? Uh, Jim's description of site fidelity and the relationship with age, I think will be part of this social grouping discussion. And then chronic stress is going to be unavoidable to some degree in a reintroduction program. And we just wanna do the best we can to minimize human contact and maximizing the positive aspects of the prior four opportunities. Um, I did have a couple of other things as, as a veterinarian who, who has the opportunity to work with these guys, some things that my brain goes to are going to be these idea of what are we gonna do for pre-release health assessment that I think we'll get in the discussion as we move along a bit. Um, how live strandings of distressed animals will be handled how post-release monitoring will be handled, and then how we're going to recover and who's going to be doing the workups for um, beach cast carcasses. With that, I, I, I thank you for the opportunity to talk. Um, there are references available at the end of the chapter, so you certainly I ask you to, to take a look at those. And following up on some of Tim's comments and Bob's comments, I selected this exit image um, for Jim Estes. Um, there's nobody I know that would appreciate this image with a couple of kids carrying their day's catch um, off the dock in Sitka, Alaska than, than Jim would. I don't know if Jim had the opportunity to, to join us today. Hopefully he'll be able to see some of these. He has been a very good friend and a mentor to me and I wish Jim well and hope he recovers very, very quickly so he can go out there and uh, do his share of damage on King Salmon. Thank you.